Howdy y'all, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to attempt to desensitize new viewers to a concept which, until recently, has been viewed more as a pseudoscience than something practical or applicable. Hot air balloons, as I've discussed in previous videos, had become a novelty and a topic of study for the most adventurous scientists as of the 18th century. We have multiple detailed reports out of Europe which conclude as much. Something that these early vessels seldom had was a power source. For the most part, the mechanical aspects of early hot air balloons were simple, involving inflation of the balloon on ground level and allowing the wind patterns around you to determine your route of travel. To apply directional steering to these miraculous devices, to apply a consistent source of energy, would be an aspect established at a much later time, creating the vessels which would be deemed to be airships. We have rigid airships of later years, like the German Hindenburg, which was constructed using a large, formidable metal frame. But we also have earlier airships, ideas by entrepreneurs and enthusiasts alike, who attempted to conquer the skies with a wide variety of unique designs. We have a multitude of different style airships arising in the early 1900s, those ingenious feats of craftsmanship, which were some of the first to apply directional navigation to the air. While these earliest of documented airships are truly a spectacle of the 20th century engineering, I'd like to peel back the proverbial page one step further and focus on the years of 1896 and 1897 specifically. In today's video, I'll be referencing Airship 1896-1897, The Advent of Techno Wizardry by Richie Cooley. This paper contains references to over a dozen other books, first-hand accounts, and a cornucopia of well-documented, nationally published, and well-criticized articles from 1896 and 1897. The topic of discussion, a mysterious airship, which was first sighted in California in 1896 before the articles of its sighting, which were almost always at dusk, were published all around the country. These articles were almost instantaneously mocked by the scientific community and the rest of the public. That is, until the sightings of the same exact vessel started appearing in local newspapers all around the country, in a pattern beginning on the west coast near San Francisco before being seen in Texas, followed by the Midwest. As newspapers began to become flooded with articles referencing this giant airship that could change direction on a dime and could essentially reach speeds over 100 miles an hour according to multiple resources, the real question around the country became, was this all a hoax? Was this a ruse? Or was this really an early airship invention? Possibly an ingenious design for which the inventor was apparently in hiding? Could this mysterious airship actually have been an inherited device, an early means of travel for which the lost civilization used to conquer the lands before the last, quote, reset? Could you look at this as ancient alien technology? I'm not one here to speculate or to often lend credit to a few individual stories or local articles. However, I do believe there is always a bit of truth into every published article, and if we know how to read between the lines, we can pick apart the apparent from the implied, and in the case of the mysterious airship of 1896 and 97, we have literally thousands of documented sightings, including signed statements and affidavits by high-ranking members of the government swearing oaths on their livelihood that they all witnessed the same enormous airship. So let us now dive into these accounts together and see what we make of this. The first accounts, which we will discuss here in a moment, of this massive airship occurred in the San Francisco Valley in late 1896. However, the same week that the first sighting of this mysterious airship occurred, there was a man who came forward by the name of George D. Collins. Now, Collins was apparently an attorney, and Collins claimed he was the attorney of the inventor or the founder of this mysterious airship. Collins came forward to newspapers all along the West Coast to openly discuss this airship, but without giving away any of the details of how exactly it worked or who its creator really was. Here is a quote given by Collins directly to the Sioux City Journal dated November 23rd, 1896. And I quote, It is perfectly true that there is at last a successful airship in existence and that California will have the honor of bringing it before the world. 
I've known of the affair for some time and am acting as attorney for the inventor. He is a very wealthy man who has been studying the subject of flying machines for 15 years and who came here seven years ago from the state of Maine in order to be able to perfect his ideas away from the eyes of other inventors. During the last five years, he has spent at least $100,000 on his work. He has not yet secured his patent, but his application is now in Washington. I cannot say much about the machine he has perfected because he is my client, and besides, he fears that the application will be stolen from the patent office if people come to know that the invention is practical. I saw the machine last week at the inventor's invitation. It is made of metal, is about 150 feet long, and is built to carry 15 people. There was no motor power, as far as I could see. Certainly no steam. End quote. Now, that's interesting to say the least. And after this, the same week, that's when these sightings started. Except the airship and all of these sightings wasn't traveling during the day. It wasn't traveling to be seen. The airship was traveling in darkness, basically moving at speeds that were unimaginable to the people of that time. The estimates that were published in different articles claimed the airship to be traveling well over 100 miles per hour. Some say 200 miles per hour. Some claim 250. And they say that it moved nearly silently. It would come to a complete stop in the middle of the air. It would be able to turn at 90 degree angles with ease. And the ship is still described like the one originally mentioned by Collins, the lawyer. It is described as a long, almost hot dog shaped or tic tac shaped vessel. And this vessel appears to have little or no motor. Yet in most of the accounts that were published, when this vessel zooms off, it doesn't seem to leave behind a cloud or dust or residue or sound. What's furthermore, as the sightings began to rise in the San Francisco Valley in November of 1896, that is when all these attorneys like Collins rise out of the woodwork to claim that they know the inventor of the airship. We also have an article that was published on Sunday, November 29th, 1896 in the San Francisco Call in which a man by the name of William Henry Harrison Hart, who once ran for the state attorney general, claimed that he was also in cahoots with the mysterious airship inventor. In this article, Hart is quoted as saying, and I quote, I have not seen it, the airship, personally, but have talked with the man who claims to be the inventor. I have spent several hours with him. He has shown me drawings and diagrams of his invention and I am convinced that they are more adapted for the purpose for which he claims them than any other invention making such claims that I have ever seen, end quote. And that's all fine and dandy. A mysterious ship, shady rich guys looking to claim it as their own, or somebody who hired them to be the attorney to claim profits. Sure, that makes sense. But what we want to know in this video is the truth. And I believe the truth can be best deduced from the multitude of sightings that were reported, beginning with those in California. In California in November 1896, hundreds of residents of the San Francisco area saw a large, elongated, dark object which carried brilliant searchlights and was capable of flying against the wind. Between January and March 1897, it vanished entirely. And suddenly, a staggering number of observations of an identical object were made in the Midwest. Pseudo-scientific research conducted by Don Hanlon and John Keel may shed the best light on this subject matter. And from John Keel's work, we have this overall summary, as well as the numerous newspaper articles which we will discuss today. And I quote, Working purely from newspaper accounts is not easy particularly because the standards of journalism in 1897 left much to be desired. But we weeded out 126 accounts that seemed reliable, named witnesses, and appeared to be responsibly written. All of these sample cases were reported in April 1897 and came from 14 different states. Actually, the spring flat began in March in several states and tapered off in May. There were mass sightings in Omaha, Nebraska in March, and in April, an airship passed directly over Chicago, Illinois, and was reportedly viewed by thousands. A few days before that sighting, on April 9th, the Chicago papers had carried articles ridiculing the reports that were coming in from other sections of the country. 
maybe the bearded inventor, decided to put on a show for the skeptical Shakogians. On the night of Saturday, April 17, 1897 alone, there were reported sightings in seven scattered towns and cities in Michigan. That same night, 12 towns in Texas, far, far from Michigan, also had sightings, as did Waterloo, Iowa, and St. Louis, Missouri. There were hundreds, if not thousands, of people involved in some of these sightings. We cannot dismiss them all, nor can we explain them. End quote. Now, I wanted to be able to throw in my own two cents on this and give my own opinion, and I didn't want to get too out of the ordinary here, but as these sightings continued to make their way across the country in 1896, beginning in California, and then coming to Texas in 1897, and making their way to the Midwest, and as these newspaper articles published began to become more assertive in these claims, we then have a mass occurrence that occurred on April Fool's Day, 1897. And on this date, we're told as many as 10,000 people were reported as witnessing this vessel flying directly over Kansas City at dusk. And it remained there basically all night. We're not in Kansas anymore. And this just made me harken back to the importance of this date, April Fool's Day. One, we have modern naysayers who may claim that this date was chosen basically to allude the public to the idea that this mysterious vessel was in fact a hoax seeing as the largest occurrence the most noted occurrence with the most people the largest sighting of this vessel occurred on april fool's day but another way to look at it would be that this date was chosen as a reveal as the time that this vessel would become apparent to everyone as we look at the history of April Fool's Day, let us not forget its earliest origins, which many attest to the Bible, including the London Advertiser, which published on March 13, 1767, an article which read, quote, The mistake of Noah sending the dove out of the ark before the water had abated on the first day of April, and to perpetuate the memory of this deliverance, it was thought proper, whoever forgot so remarkable a circumstance, to punish them by sending them upon some sleeveless errand, similar to that ineffectual message upon which the bird was sent by the patriarch, end quote. Now, imagine if this airship, metaphorically speaking, was like the dove. This vessel was sent out by some civilization to test the waters of Earth, to see if Earth was ready for this technology. That's just a theory. But the vessel could be from an otherworldly being, and that is worth noting here. As we dive into these accounts further and begin to read the accounts from the Midwest in 1897, we have many of them that read as follows, and I quote, In total, there were approximately 150 sightings in roughly 20 states. Then, in April of 1897, just as suddenly as they had started, the sightings came to an abrupt stop. While many accounts can be written off as hoaxes, mass hysteria, or even the misidentification of astral phenomena, such as comets and meteors, a handful of accounts were credible enough to generate some lift. Just a few days after the Sacramento sighting, 50 miles north, in a town called Stockton, Colonel H.G. Shaw, was driving his buggy through the countryside when he stumbled upon a landed spacecraft. According to Shaw, the vessel was roughly 25 feet in diameter, was a cylinder shape, and was 150 feet long. It had a metallic outer surface and, other than what appeared to be a rudder, was completely devoid of any additional external features. He observed three strange, slender creatures moving about the aircraft, emitting a strange, warbling noise." End quote. At Quincy, Illinois, late on the evening of April 10th, hundreds of onlookers saw a bright white light with red and green lights on either side of it flying low over the Mississippi River on the city's west side. As they watched, it rose in the air, headed east over Quincy, then south, then west. It hovered over a park for a few minutes before moving north and stopping half a mile later to hover again. It reversed direction and left in a southerly direction at a, quote, tremendous speed. And I quote, Also on April 11th, 1897, 400 persons supposedly sighted an airship 
over Norman, Oklahoma. The Daily Oklahoma devoted one sentence to this report, and now Norman has seen the airship as well, and by a bank cashier, a devout churchman, and a prominent citizen, Mr. Wiggins, end quote. In the Chicago Chronicle of April 13, 1897, appeared the following under the headline, Airship Seen in Iowa, Iowa, April 12th, and I quote, The airship was seen here at 8.30 tonight and was viewed by the whole population. It came from the southeast and was not over 200 feet above the treetops and moved very slowly, not to exceed 10 miles an hour. The machine could be plainly seen and is described as being 60 feet in length and the vibration of the wings could be plainly seen. It carried the usual colored lights and the working of the machinery could be heard as also could the strains of music, as from an orchestra. It was hailed, but passed on to the north, seeming to increase in speed, and then it disappeared. There is no doubt that it was the real thing, and is testified to by the most prominent of citizens." End quote. We also have a story by ex-Senator Harris that was published on Wednesday, April 21st, 1897, and I quote, Ex-Senator Harris said that he was awakened at 1 a.m. by a strange noise, and he was astonished to see the celebrated airship descending on his property outside of Harrisburg, Arkansas. He stepped outside and was met by the craft's occupants, conversing with them as they busied themselves, taking on a supply of fresh water. End quote. We also have two lawmen, Constable John J. Sumner and Deputy Sheriff John McLemore of Garland County, Arkansas, who signed affidavits on May 8, 1897, testifying that they had also conversed with the airship occupants. Their account was published in Helena, Arkansas on May 13th of that year. It reads as follows, and I quote, While riding northwest from this city on the night of May the 6th, 1897, we noticed a brilliant light high in the heavens. Suddenly, it disappeared, and we said nothing about it. After riding four or five miles around through the hills, we again saw the light, which now appeared to be much nearer to the earth. We stopped our horses and watched it coming down until all at once it disappeared behind another hill. We rode on about half a mile further when our horses refused to go further. About a hundred yards distant, we saw two persons moving around with the lights drawing our Winchesters, for we were now thoroughly aroused to the importance of the situation. We demanded, who is that and what are you doing? A man with a long dark beard came forth with a lantern-like device in his hand, and on being informed who we were, proceeded to tell us that he and the others, a young man and a woman, were traveling through the country in an airship. We could plainly distinguish the outlines of the vessel, which was cigar-shaped and about 60 feet long, looking just like the cuts that have appeared in the papers recently. It was dark and raining, and the young man was filling a big sack with water about 30 yards away, and the woman was particular to keep back in the dark. He said he would like to stop off in hot springs for a few days and take to the hot baths, but his time was limited and he could not. He said they were going to wind up in Nashville, Tennessee, after thoroughly seeing the country. Being in a hurry, we left, and upon our return to the location, about 40 minutes later, nothing was to be seen. We did not hear or see the airship when it departed." End quote. And while that is interesting, the most embellished sighting of them all comes to us from Dallas, Texas, and the April 19, 1897 Dallas Morning News, which published the account of a Judge Love who resided in that area. In an article titled, A Judge Sees It, Judge Love tells of his conversation with the airship crew, which he came across while on a fishing trip. And I quote, The judge offered a common description of the craft, adding it was capable of a speed of 250 miles an hour, before recounting what he was told by the five weirdly dressed men. We live in the regions of the North Pole. Contrary to the general belief, 
there is a large body of land beyond the polar seas containing about 250 square miles of territory. The first time this land was visited by human beings, so far as we know, was when the ten tribes of Israel found their way here after the captivity and dispersion of the Jews. According to tradition, they were attempting to cross Bering Straits and were carried by a floating iceberg and landed on the shores of North Pole land. The climate there, while at the time cold, was prevented from being uninhabitable by the influence of the Gulf Stream, which, after flowing for hundreds of miles, many fathoms under the surface of the sea in that region, came to the surface and flows entirely around the continent of the North Pole land. You wonder how I speak English? Well, the polar expedition of Sir Hugh Willoughby in 1553, who, with his crew, was supposed to have been lost, as a matter of fact, succeeded in reaching the North Pole land. The ship had been so wrecked and broken up by the voyage that Sir Willoughby and his crew were unwilling to risk a return trip. Therefore, they remained with us at North Pole land. End quote. So that's about as out there as it gets. We basically have claims being made here that people were attempting to speak to this vessel, not when they were in large cities and it was flying overhead, but when they were in small groups in the wilderness and they would encounter this vessel. People were making claims that they talked to the people from this vessel, the humanoid creatures, that these creatures said that they had encountered human beings in the North Pole, that they had a base in the North Pole, that there was land that was habitable in the North Pole. And then you look at Project High Jump and you look at things that happened with the US government some 50 years later or so, and you look at Admiral Byrd and you look at all the things that he did to try to explore the North Pole and you wonder if there's any sort of credible information that's actually being given here in these newspaper articles. Like I said at the beginning of this video, one thing that we must do is read between the lines here. And I believe, especially in this case, when we see what happened later and how this information was basically in the 1890s looked at as a hoax, yet we have operations that are happening based off this information some 40 or 50 years later. And I just find that really revealing in this narrative. But that's about it. That was the 1890s when we have a multitude of sightings of this same vessel that was happening all around the United States. This could be a hoax, yes, but we also have accredited doctors, lawyers, and government officials risking their reputations claiming to have seen or represent this craft. We also have over 200 unique sightings by tens of thousands of people in less than a one-year period from a wide range of states across the U.S. We have descriptions of the vessel that all match, published on nearly the same dates in areas hundreds of miles away from each other, all describing basically the exact same craft, meaning if this was a fabrication, if this was a hoax, this was one that had to have been planned months to years ahead of time. Finally, we have a claim from someone who says that they actually spoke to the owners or the conductors of this airship. So while many want to claim that this is some sort of UFO or alien technology or from an alien origin, as we apply what we read today, this science, to what we've already read about in my other videos, looking into old world research about Tartary or about the missing civilization, some don't like to call it Tartary, but about the civilization of advanced technology that seemed to be here before the last reset about airships and mooring masts, about the abundance of platforms that were built for airships, yet nobody uses the airships anymore, but we still have these massive buildings that have basically spots for these airships, about the ideas that old stadiums and things like that, the locations that are designed like that could really have been housing stations for these airships, we're looking at a lost society of the past, about the tales of the worldwide, really, society, this united society that was pre-existing. We have highly advanced cultures, highly advanced architecture, and now we're looking at highly advanced flying vessels that are coming to us really out of nowhere, appearing in the late 1890s. And 
I'd really just love to hear what your opinion is about all this down below. But if we want to look at it in the sense of at least theorizing that there was some sort of advanced previous society, one that had advanced architecture, had advanced abilities, or at least had advanced knowledge and the ability to build these sort of airships. If you want to look at that as they basically stemmed out from somewhere. I made a video previously where it appears they stemmed out of Northern India. That's why we refer to them as Tartary because that's where this knowledge came from that area, but others don't like to use the word Tartary, but I do. So we can say that this Tartarian civilization really branched out. It brought its knowledge to the better parts of the world, but eventually the knowledge was able to corrupt a certain group of individuals and they in return look to out this society they look to remove this technology these free advancements from the public's eye and basically that shifted this society in this theory and that society in this theory then traveled across the sea across the atlantic and ended up in america now i can't give you an exact timeline for this because again this is all a theory and time is really of the essence in this discussion in the fact of we can't really match things up perfectly with the timeline but according to this theory we can say that they left europe at some point and they settled in the americas at which point they kind of thrived in the americas that's where we get all of the quote native american and indigenous structures that are so magnificent that the indigenous people themselves have tales for because they can't explain how these mounds and these other epic features were built but I digress. Basically, at some point, the Europeans then made their way to America. They made their way to the East Coast. So at that point, that's when the ancient mound builders, these other people that were probably leftovers from the pre-reset civilization, that's when they themselves moved west in America. That's when they crossed the mountain ranges. And that's when they ended up in what I would theorize is California. That's why you get all the old stories of California, of the Amazonians, of all the epic architecture, and the island of California. You get all of these, quote, hoaxes that occurred about California as well. And I believe that really stems from if there was this ancient pre-reset civilization that brought knowledge to the world, and they really were being pushed back, basically pushed further and further to the edge, I believe their edge became California. And at some point, eventually, the European settlers even made their way to California. And at that point, you just have this small little patch of this pre-reset civilization that basically refuses to assimilate with the rest of the public or is unable to basically create its own utopia again. So that is when you have all of these devices really coming to the public eye. You have technology that seems to be pre-reset coming back to the light like these airships and like other massive guns massive weaponry star forts and things like that it all appears to stem from this rediscovery of this ancient pre-reset civilization that was only discovered when the europeans pushed the whole way to the west coast and encountered these individuals once again now did they know what they were discovering did they have any idea what these airships really were I'm not exactly sure, but what we do have is within a couple years of the panic of 1896 and 1897 regarding these airships in America, then we have airships becoming the really commonplace around the country. We have massive amounts of companies dedicating time and ingenuity to building these airships, and they become seen really all around the country of America and all around the world. Dirigibles become what a lot of people thought would be the future of travel and yet within 30 to 40 years of that happening we have the hindenburg disaster and then we have the use of airships basically being erased from history and a lot of it appears to have been covered over purposefully we don't hear a lot about airships anymore and i think there's a reason for that and i think this whole panic of 1896 and 97 is a good place to start when we look into the esoteric research regarding these airships What's really strange here is when the initial 1896 and 1897 airship craze began to die off, which it did very rapidly in 1897, it was almost entirely forgotten about and it seems like it was forgotten about almost instantly. When you look at the articles and the way that they're published, we have a resurgence of reports coming out roughly 14 years later with the same 
sensationalized reporting in local newspapers about airships flying over cities again. But what's more remarkable is none of these articles from really 1910, 1911, 1912, none of these articles seem to make any mention of the dirigible crisis and the dirigible craze that happened nationwide only roughly a decade earlier. Quoting Jeremy Clark here, who says, One curious feature of the post-1887 airship waves was the failure of each to stick in historical memory. Although 1909, for example, brought a flood of sightings of airships worldwide and attendant discussion and speculation, contemporary accounts do not allude to the hugely publicized events of little more than a decade earlier, end quote. Basically saying that newspaper articles published in 1909, 1910, 1911, even here in America, none of them made mention to the airship craze of 1896 and 1897. Seeming like either the public had somehow forgotten Men in Black style, or for some reason, it was purposefully being left out of this narrative. So I just found that to be very interesting as well. Is this entire mystery really a hoax? We had airships that were already in use in 1896 and 1897, successfully, albeit without nearly any of the features that were said to be on this mysterious airship. If it is a hoax, how would this hoax have been constructed? And who would be the ones benefiting from America believing that aliens or fallen angels or something esoteric really existed in the 19th century. What we do know is after some time, air travel really did become possible. Real airships, real advanced ones were created, which eventually led to all sorts of other advancements in aeronautical technologies. The airship of 1896, whether it was a hoax or not, seems to have been the linchpin to start all of this. So I just want to know what do you think down below? Let me know in the comments and if you'd like to support my channel, you can do so at this link right here. Just enter that into your browser. Finally, you're all like family to me, and your ideas and your encouragement and even your criticism helps this channel to keep getting better, and I just wanted to say thank you all for that. I appreciate all of you, and I look forward to hearing what you have to say about this aeronautical advancement of 1896 in the comments down below. We will talk about it on the next video. I hope to see you there. Cheers, everybody.